So thank you once again for joining us. And without further ado, I would like to welcome our chairman, Brian Christian, Managing Director of Direct Edge. Now, Brian Christian serves as head of sales for Direct Edge, the third largest stock exchange in the US, which handles approximately 12% of US equity trading volume daily. Brian leads the strategic development and implementation of innovative products and pricing that support trading on the firm's dual equity exchange platforms, Edge A and Edge X and adoption of the firm's expanding suite of connectivity and data services. Prior to Direct Edge, Brian served as Managing Director of Sales at NASDAQ OMX and as Global Connectivity Manager at Bloomberg Tradebook. He began his career in London as a business analyst at Merrill Lynch International. Welcome, Brian. So good morning and welcome to the first day of the Trading Show Chicago, a conference that looks at nonstop evolution of trading, investing in compliance in today's marketplace, and addresses industry challenges moving forward. A lot has happened since the last time we met. For one thing, the market indices are higher. This despite a lot of attention about market structure glitches that have brought into question the stability of the trading industry itself and has impacted investor confidence. However, if you've invested in the S&P 500 at the close of trading of, flat, of the flash crash of 2010, you would have gained 49%. The same index strategy would have risen 22% if on the same day of the failed Facebook IPO. These two events some people point to as the reason for the loss of investor confidence in today's markets. While there's no de denying that market participation needs to stay vigilant in mitigating sy systemic risk and preventing glitches, there's also evidence that the capital market system works well, and it's a viable alternative than sitting in the sidelines. At Direct Edge, we have accelerated <clears throat> a number of offerings in our Edge Risk Suite. Basically, the Edge Risk Suite focuses on risk protection due to high client demand in advance of the SEC's Regulation, System, Compliance, and Integrity Initiative, or Reg SCI. That regulation will enforce technology standards for exchanges and market participants to better mitigate the risk of glitches. Clearly, investors want to protect themselves and their systems against causing or becoming caught up in an unreasonable outcome in the markets, such as irrational, such as irrational price swings, or rogue algorithms. Accenture, for example, should not go from $40 to a penny to $39 after a span of a few minutes like it did in the flash crash, May 6th, 2010. It is to everybody's advantage in the room to take steps to boost investor confidence and prevent unreasonable outcomes in the markets. I look forward to hearing the perspective of today's speakers and panelists on that subject as, the, as this conference is known to attract speakers who provide insightful commentary. Speaking of insightful commentary, it's my honor this morning to introduce Bart Chilton, Commissioner of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Bart was first nominated by President Bush and confirmed as the Commissioner of the US, by the US Senate in 2007. He was re-nominated by President Obama and reconfirmed by the Senate. His career spans 25 years in government service, working on Capitol Hill in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. Bart has also served in the executive branch during the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administration. Commissioner uh, Bart Chilton is a regular on business television programs. In fact, he appeared on Bloomberg Television this morning, giving a sneak peek at what he's gonna say today. But all, all of his speeches are unique. Take the last three. A speech in New York City 10, day, 10 days ago entitled Cinema of Uncertainty, referenced 25 movies, very impressive. Last week at Baker and Hostetler Hedge Fund Conference, in a speech entitled Rockin' the Trouble, 
He used the board game trouble with a pop o matic to determine which subject he'd speak about. And on Friday, in his future voice speech, he traveled from 1848 to 2014 to take a look around markets. As known as the most candid and colorful uh, federal regulator, let's see what Commissioner Chilton has to tell us today in his speech about the autonomy of speed. Welcome, Bart Chilton. tunes to our sound guys. I mean, Fleetwood Mac and everything, I feel so at home. One of my favorite things to do is, uh, you know, put uh, uh, references to, to song lyrics and whether or not it's a Broadway show or country, but uh, my favorite is always classic rock. So um, good job for Terrapin for having hot and tasty tunes coming right at you. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction. It is a real pleasure to be here. I've spoken to Terrapin before. They do very good events. Uh, before I get started, I want to find out, uh, sort of make up of the audience, how many folks are from banks, investment banks? Okay. Uh, how many exchange officials are here? Great, good, good, excellent. And how many HFTs? Good, okay, thank you, and welcome. And you guys are impressive, with the HFTs. You're all, you're all impressive. You're a really good looking group. But we're going uh, to talk a little bit about HFTs today. Um, my, my greeting that I should actually give you is Jumbo, Jumbo, J-A-M-B-O. Anybody know where that comes from? Swahili, you know Swahili folks? And the reason is, they say Jumbo, and by the way, when I say Jumbo, hello, the response is also Jumbo, thank you very much, Jumbo, Jumbo, Jumbo. Uh, but you know, Swahili is what they speak in Tanzania. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about Tanzania and technology. That's, you came for that, right? Little technology and Tanzania together. Nice little mix. Good. Well, we're going to do it either way. Uh, it won't be too painful, I promise. So, and by the way, we're going to. There may be a quiz on the Swahili because we got a couple others. So, Jumbo, hello, right? Okay. Uh, but before we get to some of the meat of the substance, I'm going to speak just briefly about magazines because I want to. I love magazines. I still read them. Anybody out there read, you know, paper? Remember? Anybody? Really? Look, tell me. Okay, good. Favorite magazines? Anybody want to venture to yell out what they are? Snuff. Snuff? What's snuff? <laughs> like killing people? That, like only in Chicago would there be a magazine called Snuff. Uh, well, I love Bloomberg Business Week, but I always feel like that's a little bit too much work for me because it's so related to what I do, you know, but it's, I love it. Um, I really like Rolling Stone. Uh, Matt Taibbi, you know, I know he's progressive and stuff, but I really like him. He does some super work. Uh, but that also sort of feels like a little bit of work to me, you know, because it's financial stuff that he writes about. But I can never get enough of Mick and Keith, the, the boss, so I love Rolling Stone. It's a, like you know, sort of a 70s, 80s version of People magazine for rockers. I love it. Uh, but I'm thinking of two other magazines that I want you to maybe guess at, and you might not feel comfortable guessing the first one. There are a couple of magazines that people collected. Collected. Uh, I actually thought of a third one since I wrote this. But what magazines did people collect? Like, ex you know what, and I had that one and I deleted it because it's such a dated reference that I thought, well, nobody's going to know it. God dang it, I messed up again. Great, life, excellent. Yeah. Right on, yeah. man. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. That's, that's, that's it, thank you. I'm looking for one more, maybe two more. Playboy. Playboy, Playboy right. It was always, they, the, the, so the collector stored those in your dad's closet for the articles, right? <laughs> TV Guide's a good one. I hadn't thought of that one. The other one I was thinking of, one more guess, it was small. Reader's Digest. Those are pretty much the ones that I can think of. But it is National Geographic. And I didn't have to give you any hints on the National Geographic. I was going to say it's smaller, it's got a yellow binder. And then my joke was, who yelled out the phone book? You must have been out late last night. But no, National Geographic, you got it so easily. That's great. I'm very impressed. So I was reading this story 
last November. Is it by a guy named Roth, R-O-F-F, -F, not from Chicago, Smith, Roth Smith. And it's called Cheetahs on the Edge. And so naturally I pick it up because I term HFTs affectionately, I promise. Uh, cheetahs, because they're fast, fast, fast. Out there trying to scoop up microdollars in these millisecond markets. Uh, and there's a lot of similarities, but not until, and I've been doing this for three years, terming HFTs cheetah, cheetahs. So I read this story in uh, Cheetahs on the Edge of National Geo, in Nat Geo. And it's, there are so many similarities. It's amazing, and it's a super article, and they've got uh, great photography in there like they always do with National Geographic. But it talks about how cheetahs uh, persevere, uh, even in hot and cold climates, good and bad markets, and how they know their terrain so very well. That they know the landscape, the topography, just like market cheetahs have this sense of what's going on and what happens if this happens and you know what myriad thing do I what myriad things do I do if this set of circumstances exist. The cheetahs in the wild in Tanzania, which by the way, our second one here, let's start real slow. Jumbo. Jumbo. All right, thank you. Very good. All right, the second one, cheetahs in Swahili are called Duma. Duma. Sort of like Puma except with a D. Duma. Duma. Okay, so the, the, the dumas. So in the wild, knowing their uh, topography, what they'll do is they'll figure out the way to get whatever, the Thompson's gazelle or, or, or whatever their, their prey is. They'll figure out where is it best to get them and where, is they have the, where, do, where does their prey have the least chance to escape. Very similar. And cheetahs have been highly prized. The article talks about this, not only now, they talked about this huge, you know, underground trade and little cute cheetah cubs and how people wanted them, but dating for years and years back where uh, the cheetahs were highly prized and they were, you know, the, the, all the, the royalty used to have the cheetahs and put big collars around them, et cetera, et cetera. And cheetahs are highly prized today in our market. Uh, if you're a law firm, you might, like so highly priced cheetahs on retainer. Uh, if you're a politician, you might like to be good buddies from a campaign perspective with some highly priced cheetahs. So they're highly prized today. And like cheetahs in the wild, the HFT cheetahs, uh, and again, they're super impressive. I mean, unbelievably smart, and I think it's great. I think the technology is great, I think the smart stuff is great. But like the cheetahs in the wild, uh, they also go after the most vulnerable prey. And that's what's happening in markets today also. That's what's happening. So we had a study that we, we did back in December. It hadn't been talked about a lot, but when cheetahs trade among themselves, they don't make much money. When they trade with a commercial trader, a fundamental trader, somebody who has uh, you know some skin in the game with regard to the end use, whether whatever it is, crude oil or beans or metals, whatever it is. They make, the cheetahs, on average, an average 50,000 uh, uh, contract size trade. They make, on average, $1.92 on every contract. $1.92 on every contract. When they trade with a smaller retail, a less sophisticated trader, easier prey, they make $3.49. $3.49. That's who they go after. Now, you know, everybody's out there, fend for yourself, survive us of the fittest, survival of the fittest. But as long as we're aware that that's going on, I mean, you can't tell people they gotta wise up or they're gonna get eaten by a cheetah. But at least people should know that that's going on in markets. And I'm not necessarily saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just pointing it out. I'm just pointing it out. There's some other things that may, there may be some problems with some other things, but I'm just making you all aware of that. So I'm gonna short circuit something I was gonna talk about here because I don't, I hate being repetitive. Has anybody heard me speak before on cheetahs? Anybody? Yeah, like 10 people. Uh, so I'm gonna say, for the rest of you guys, it was really good. Every time I talk about it, it's fantastic, right? Yes, thank you, you're all shaking your head. But I talk about a bunch of things that I've been calling for with regard to cheetahs. 
The reason I can short circuit this discussion for you all today is that legislation has been introduced to do many of the things that I've talked about. Uh, it's been introduced by Congressman Ed Markey in the House, uh, who I've long admired since I worked in the House starting back in 1985. Uh, Congressman Markey is running for Senate. The election is actually tomorrow. Uh, we'll see what, see what happens. He might be, by the way, one of the odd birds that if he gets elected to the Senate, and I don't know what's going to happen, I haven't read the polls, he may be one of those odd birds that can actually have companion legislation in both the House and the Senate that they he drafted. But the PROTECT Act, calls it the PROTECT Act, which is H.R. 2292, would require registration of cheetahs. Uh, that fully brings them under our authority. Uh, there's a way to get it looking at HF2 cheetahs now, but it's a little bit, there's a little bit of step steps we have to go through to get some information. Uh, it would require testing of programs, which, is there any cheetah here that doesn't do testing before your programs go in the live production environment? Right, they, the, the good ones do. We just have the good ones here, guys. Aren't we lucky? But there are some that don't. There are some that don't do testing before their programs get put into the live production environment. And most of the good ones have kill switches. I mean, the exchanges have uh, stopped logic here in Chicago. ICE has uh, essentially their version of a circuit breaker, slows down trading. But the cheetahs should have kill switches of their own in case their scary fast cheetah programs go feral. So uh, the legislation would require that. And finally, the legislation would increase penalties. And not just for cheetahs, but for all market participants uh, or exchange officials, uh, exchanges, or exchange officials, when they violate the Commodity Exchange Act. And I'll just say one word about this, or two sentences maybe. That currently our regulatory regime requires that we, or allows us only to find $140,000 per violation. The reason I'm doing a little finger air quotes is because a violation has been construed to mean once per day. That's the case law, the, the law said per violation, but it's pretty much been once per day. But that's dating back to when, you know, you didn't have millisecond markets. Let me give you some new data here in a minute that for a lot of you it may blow you away. It blew me away. So, if this, the PROTECT Act would increase fines from 140,000 per violation to one million per an individual and 10 million per, uh, a firm, an entity, 10 million per an entity. And it would give us the flexibility to decide what a violation is. We wouldn't just have to rely on the, the case law. The legislation would say, we clearly have the ability to uh, determine that a violation is less than on a per day basis. It would be very clear. Now, whether or not you say it's by the second or something, that would be determined later but it would clearly give us the authority. So that's the PROTECT Act. Um, our reauthorization, not to get too down in the weeds on DC speak, et cetera, but every five years, different agencies are different years. Ours is on a five-year basis. We have to be reauthorized. That's a chance, the reauthorization of the Commodity Exchange Act is a chance to see if anything else needs to be tweaked. Like maybe we shouldn't have this antiquated penalty regime um, or other things. And, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to talk about other things that I think need to be addressed that I'm not going to be discussing with you all today. But I'm hopeful that the PROTECT Act, Congressman Markey's Act, maybe Senator Markey's Act in the future, will be included in either the House or the Senate reauthorization of the Commodity Exchange Act later this year. Okay, now I get on some new stuff. Talk about two primary things, maybe three. What are cheetahs called? Duma, Duma. You remember the first one, Jumbo. Jumbo, Jumbo. okay. Duma, Jumbo, and Duma. All right, so today I wanna to talk about Dumas today. What's going on? What's going on today? No place in the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which is Dodd-Frank, it was passed in 2010. Not one place is there a single word about high frequency traders. Does not exist. That's how 
relatively new, and of course they existed before 2010, but they weren't seen to cause any issues. That's how new cheetahs are to markets. But not one place were they even mentioned. Now, maybe there's no reason. I think there are a few. But that's how new they are. And it's crazy to think that there's no mention in light of the fact that they comprise 30 to 50% of markets, and that's an average. Well, at times it's much more than 50%, sometimes it's lower than 50%, just like the cheetahs in Tanzania. They can deal in cold climates, they can deal in hot climates, cold markets, hot markets. So the average 30 to 50%. I'm gonna lay some new data on you right now. Right now, here it comes. We did a study of every single trading second last year. Every single trading second. It was 255 trading days. We looked at 20 million separate seconds. And by the way, we can now even go further than look at the second. I'll talk about that a little bit later. We can get to the millisecond now, which you need to do in these markets. So we looked at 20 million seconds and then we got down and we said, where are the cheetahs trading the most? We got it all the way down to 189,000 of those 20 million seconds, 189,000. And in those 189,000, we found that they trade between 100 times, this is as a group, not one, not one cheetah, as a group. They, and I'm talking about one contract here. So one contract, it's a financial contract, one contract, they trade as a group between 100 and 500 times per second. Per second. It's like mind blowing numbers. Numbers that nobody's talked about in public before, by the way. I mean, not anywhere close to talking about those numbers. We always know that they're fast, right? We always know that cheetahs trade a lot. We always know that move markets move. But 100 to 500 times per second? Holy mother of Duma! That's a lot. And what it means is that we need to think about markets differently. It's way too easy for people to say, yeah, the cheetahs are just the new floor traders. There's always been scalpers and middlemen. They're just the new ones. Get with it, man. Ain't no big deal. Now, maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe everything's okay. The exchanges love the volume. I don't have a problem with cheetahs making money. You would think people on the other side of the trades might love the volume. Deep liquid markets. Oh, the most deep, liquid, splendor markets. Just looking out in the prairie in the Tanzanian jungle. It's not like that necessarily. Because regulators don't have a profit motive. And those guys who are paying, they're getting stuck with $3.49 every time they trade, it ain't so pristine to them. So as a regulator, I think it's my job to just say, let's take a little chill pill, let's step back and look at it before we just swallow it down whole and think it's all great. And this is larger than just our fine furry friends, by the way. I mean, this is all technology. I don't want to be a caveman, they look like a caveman, but I don't want to, look, I don't want to be a caveman on this stuff and say technology bad. Of course it's not. But we've seen market snafu after market snafu for the last couple of years. I used to keep a log of them. It got too long. I mean, you can go on and on and on, whether that's a Facebook IPO or this exchange shutting down or that exchange shutting down or putting testing protocols into the live production environment a couple of years ago, people losing money. It happens all the time. Considering the amount of trades, it's actually amazing it doesn't happen more often. So kudos to the exchange in that regard. But it still happens. So we as regulators just shouldn't accept, and I think people as market participants, I don't think you guys should accept that it's all good. At least question. Let's at least be, you know, have wide, eyes wide open. 
on this stuff. So it's talk a little bit more about liquidity. Because the first thing you say when you talk to a cheetah, they say, well, we provide liquidity to markets. Well, liquidity's good. Gotta be great. It's all great. But I'm not so sure it's always great. I mean, if you want somebody to hedge a soybean crop for two seconds, I guess, you know, maybe that's good. But these are different types of cats than we saw in the past, where speculators would hold on to things for, you know, even a full day, even day traders, right? Hold on to it, they want to be flat at the end of the day, but they hold on to it for a few hours at the end of the day. People would hold on to it for weeks, do something for the summer driving season, the harvest season. Not like that, 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 that. It's completely different. It's too easy to say these are just the new day traders. So liquidity. What's going on is a dirty little secret. It's a dirty little secret. And that is that wash sales are taking place. The cheetahs are involved in, at times, and, I'm not, and the ones here are the best ones in the bunch. They're not doing it, I'm sure. They're trading with themselves. Little old Billy Idelson, dancing with myself. Oh, 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 oh. I got nothing to lose and nothing to prove. Oh, I'm dancing with myself. Oh, oh, oh. That's what they're doing. They got nothing to lose because they're not taking on any risk. They put out a bid. There's an offer here. They match. No risk. Now, if this was occurring just a little bit, Ah, people bump into each other. This guy's in New York, this guy's in Singapore, they trade on NYMEX or they trade on ICE, and they just happened to hit each other. <laughs> Could have had a V8. If that was it, you know, you gotta look at it, but no harm, no foul. But it's more than that. My lawyers won't let me say how many trades. Voluminous trades. My brain exploded with the number of trades per second, 100 to 500. And those are separate from watch trades, by the way. That was just number of time. I'm not talking about, now we're talking watch trades. That was just trading. But when I first heard this number on the number of watch trades, it was a big number. <laughs> Unbelievable number to me. A number so large that I thought, why are they doing this? Why would they do it? Why would they be allowed to do it? The exchanges have to know this. Why are we allowed to do it? Well, we just found the information out. So we're working on it. So there's two theories as to why I think the bad cheat, not the good ones that are here, but the bad cheat is maybe involved in this. One, it could be just like the Duma in Tanzania. They could be trying to set a trap for the easy prey, start making it look like there's a lot of volume. What's going on here? When it's really fantasy liquidity. And then some of you smaller retail guys or some of you fundamental traders say, well, look, it's a big market, lots of volume, I gotta get in there. Watch out. Hold on to your limbs. Be careful about the digits. The dollar digits and the digits. So it could be a ruse to get other traders to, in, to get into the market. That's one reason. And by the way, this stuff is patently based upon, I always gotta put my little lawyer's hat on here, based upon the facts and circumstances, it may be illegal. Again, they could bump into each other. But the law, the law says it's illegal. Exchange rules say, it's prohibited. So that's one reason. The other reason, theoretical reason, that they might be doing this, is that the cheetahs, just like some of our investment bank friends, are engaged, are, are part of market maker programs. The hundreds of market maker programs that exist, where people, traders, get paid to trade to provide liquidity they get a little bit of the big. They get a little payment for that. 
But if I'm dancing with myself, uh oh, uh oh, I'm taking no risk and I'm getting paid. That's not only illegal, that's dangerous to other traders in the market. And if it impacts price discovery, it's dangerous to consumers. We're all consumers. I'll drink milk or orange juice or have a home mortgage or buy jewelry or build a house. I mean, these markets impact about everything everybody purchases in the world in some tangential way. Now, if you're exchanges, you say, well, I like the volume. I like this scary fast volume. 100 to 500 trades per second. Yeah, we're very aware of that. We like that. But of course, they don't want to condone anything that's illegal. They don't want regulators like me saying, well, this could be a problem. So they, they don't want to, you know, cut off their nose to spite their face. Exchanges don't want to do that. So that's an issue that is being addressed right now, as we speak. Uh, CME's put a proposal forward with regard to wash blocker guidance. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Intercontinental Exchange does the same thing. Now, how this works is the exchanges will provide to us their plan. In CME's case, in this thing, it's on their website. It's not, not giving you anything confidential. It says how they're going to do this wash blocker guidance what they're going to say about it. This is in addition to the rules that they already have that I mentioned earlier. So my issue is, is that appropriate? I mean, you would think, well, you just talked about how wash trades are bad. They want to stop them or slow them down. Why would you just accept it, swallow it? Just like the rest of the technology issues I talked about, right? The state of play is that unless we act by Thursday to tell CME, take a chill pill, hold on for a minute, that it'll go into effect on July 1st. And I'm saying, let's take a chill pill, which will mean we'll give it a 30-day comment period to the public. All you guys can tell us what you think about it. And then we will have up to 90 days. It doesn't have to be 90 days to render a determination. And it may be that it's totally fine. It may be that it's exactly the right thing to do. But maybe ICE has a different idea. Maybe CME has the best idea. Maybe ICE has the best idea. Maybe one of you have a better idea. I just don't want to swallow this. I just want to make sure we know what we're doing. All, all too often, regulators are just reactive. We don't look around the corner. We don't think. We don't listen enough. We're typical, ugly bureaucrats like most of you think we are. I want to change that. And I think this is a good example of where we need to, even though we agree with the ultimate end game for the exchanges, take a step back. So I'm going to end there, uh, and I'll leave you with this final thing. We are getting better and better at <coughs> regulating markets, and in particular, cheetahs. We're getting more tools. We can look at the milliseconds right now. One one thousandth of a second we can look at, and given what I told you about the number of trades, we need to do that. There's 100 to 500 in a, in a second. We need to be able to look at the milliseconds. But we're getting more authority. If this PROTECT Act passes, we'll have even more. I anticipate the future will be looking at, in, at instant messages and text messages. And if people are doing things in the proper fashion, then there's not one problem whatsoever. Nothing to worry about. But if you're violating the law, watch out! Because we are slow, because we're bureaucrats. But we are persistent SOBs. And we are also a breed of our own. Last thing I want to leave you with is Asante. Another Swahili. And that's thank you. You guys all say Asante? Asante. So we got, we got Jumbo, Duma, and Asante. Asante, Asante. Thanks very much, guys. We just have time for uh, one or two questions before we go to the next panel. So I'll just bring the mic over. Just remember to uh, introduce yourself so everyone knows who you are before you ask your question. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Chilton. Uh, Mark Connors, for his dimensions, uh, I'm a risk consultancy in New York. Um, one of the uh, questions my clients have it goes to your last comment. If you're doing everything fine, nothing to worry about, transparency and how we'll leave. But um, hedge funds, uh, in particular, have been concerned about having something, bringing a regulator in, take time from their business because the staff may not be um, uh, educated, so they're now in the form of not being regulated, but professor to a staff. So I think people being more okay with, with that dialogue if it didn't hurt so much. Um, and again, maybe not from your um, commission, but from others. So what are you doing to educate to make it a less painful discovery process? Yeah, it's a good question, and I get concerned about it too. It, it's a balancing act. I mean, we've got these uh, boatload of new regulations with Dodd Frank, and in general, um, you know, we've had this, these issues about how you know do people really want to be open with you, and all of a sudden you're listening to a conversation where they're educating you, and you're like, oh, you're doing that? We got you. Uh, so it doesn't really encourage you know cross fertilization, um, but uh, and that's why I think it's good that we have commissioners, by the way. Uh, that can take a, like a more a broader look at what's going on, and uh, you know we shouldn't be involved in, in, in gotcha regulations. We need to make things very clear, but it's going to be increasingly difficult, particularly now that we have swaps. All the futures markets are about five trillion dollars in annualized trading. The swaps markets is seven, that's seven hundred trillion dollars worldwide, and that's equities too. But we're going to have a couple hundred trillion dollars worth of things to oversee. So we're learning about swaps now. And we've, we've got guys that we've never met us before. Uh, and there are people here that we've never met before. So it really is about, I think, developing a relationship, trying not to, to trying to be thoughtful and not taking too much of your time. But we want to know your business. We want to understand it. And a lot of us are bureaucrats and we don't get it. So I think it's probably you know in everybody's interest to go ahead, take the time. Uh, whenever I travel, I, I make my own time available to go out and, listen to people and learn how they're doing things. But uh, I mean, the, the bottom line is it really is a balancing act and hopefully you don't get a bad actor that's a regulator that comes in and plays gotcha uh, on enforcement. So, uh, and be Chilton at cftc.gov if you do. That's my email address and I'm real good at getting back. Be Chilton at cftc.gov. And by the way, do you guys have any questions or comments on any of this stuff I said you think I'm full of it and want to tell me so? Feel free. I'm always used as a doormat too, so no problems whatsoever. Got time for one more, or is that it? One final one. A uh, big, big thank you for Okay, thanks guys. Have a great conference. Thanks, Terry.